Bibles this morning. We turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, continuing in our series, Dinner with Jesus. I was thinking this morning about remembering. And the thought occurred to me, and come to me, that I have a bad habit. I don't know if it's a bad habit, just a habit, of keeping a, a hat on my dashboard. I've always done it since I was a teenager. Keep a hat on my dashboard and just grab it, put it on if I need to. My dad passed away. He gave me, well, I received all of his hats. And so the hat that I have on my dashboard is usually a hat that my dad owned. I usually where you see me in a hat, it's going to be a hat that my dad had. Usually the hats that my kids wear, a lot of them are hats that my dad wore. When I see those hats, I'm reminded of him. I remind, I'm reminded of the advice he used to give me. I'm reminded of, you know, the way he used to play with me and the times we shared together, the meals we had together. And this brings me a new appreciation for the great father that I had. And I look forward to seeing one day again in eternity. Remembering is a big deal. We're supposed to remember. We're not supposed to forget certain things. And with that in mind this morning, we're going to remember something called the last Passover. This is the last Passover meal that Jesus ever attended. It's in Luke chapter 22. And you know, in Jewish culture, Passover has always been a big deal. It's one of the three mandatory feasts where if you were an adult male, you were required to go to Jerusalem during this fast. If you, were, if you lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem and you were an adult male, you, you, adult male, you were required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But even if you didn't live near Jerusalem, say you were part of the dispersion of Jews that went out all over the world. Say you lived in Poland or, 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 or the, the U.S. or some other place like that. When it came that time of year, when it came time for Passover, the prayer was always next year in Jerusalem. It's always a dream of a Jewish person to at least once in their life go to Jerusalem during the Passover. Be there in the holy city for the Seder feast. And then the hope and dream and the prayer, they, the Jews will always say, next year in Jerusalem. As we look at the Gospel of Luke this morning, we look at chapter 22 and uh, Jesus and his disciples are in the holy city for the Seder feast. They're in the holy city for the final Passover that Jesus will ever attend. We know that the Passover looks back to the deliverance of the Jews and we all know the story. It looks back to deliverance in Egypt and the death of the firstborn. The Israelites had been turned into slaves and they were uh, being oppressed as slaves in the land of Egypt and their taskmasters were abusing them and they cried out to God. They cried out to God, God, please deliver us from the hand of the Egyptians. And God heard their, pro their cry and sent a deliverer named Moses to deliver them from their oppression. But there was a king in the land of Egypt, which was called Pharaoh. And he had such a tight grip on the Israelites that he said, I will not let them go. So enter Moses and the ten plagues. So Passover is a look back at an oppressive king. But Passover is also a look forward to a coming kingdom. And for almost 1,500 years, the Jews were commanded to keep the Passover. And the Jews knew what the Passover meant. They knew which each element of the Passover stood for. They knew the symbolism. 
But Jesus is about to come in and Jesus is about to turn everything upside down. And Jesus is about to transform this meal into something else. And Jesus is going to change its meaning and Jesus is going to change its significance. He's literally going to fulfill this meal, if you will. What does the Passover teach us? The Passover teaches us that there, 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 there can be no redemption. There can be no atonement for sin without death. That's the only way. The only way to stop the judgment of God. The only way to avert the wrath of God is blood has to be shed. There must be death or there will be no life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But there's something else that the Passover teaches us. The Passover teaches us that there can be a substitute. That there can be a life exchanged for another life. In the case of the ancient Jews, it was a lamb that was slain. The blood was applied to the doorpost. And God passed over the Israelites. Let me tell you this morning that redemption and substitutions and substitution are bedrocks of the gospel. They're tenets of the Christian faith. And I think as we remember the work of the Lord through the Lord's Supper, we should do that. But we also need to remember the Passover and its meaning as well. So what is this sermon going to be about this morning? This message this morning is going to be a verse by verse study. Of the first 20 verses of Luke chapter 22. That's what we're going to do. We're going to walk step by step, verse by verse, through Luke's account of the last Passover meal. With that brings us to our first point this morning. And we're going to call it Passover perdition. Passover perdition in reference to the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. Let's look at verse number one this morning. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Now, I want you to notice the two things in this verse. We have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then we have the Passover. Now, a lot of time, these two feasts, they're lumped in the one. So first, we have the Passover. The Passover was one day. The Passover took place on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. Right after the month of Honda. No, just nobody got that joke, so I'm going to move forward. Just kidding. And thank you, Hamley. I appreciate that. And then immediately following that day, from the 15th to the 21st day, was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And, you know, and a lot of times you find these two terms locked together. You find these two terms being used interchangeably because it was an eight day festival. It was one day followed by seven more days. Now, the idea of unleavened bread was very simple. The Israelites had to leave Egypt in such a hurry that they did not have time to put yeast into their bread And let it rise. So they had to leave with unleavened bread. And the Jews were to remember the Passover. And they were to remember the unleavened bread in these two festivals. Verse 2. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death. For they were afraid of the people. Now, I'm sure that each one of these Pharisees and each one of these scribes and each one of these chief priests, I'm sure that they had went through their house. And I'm sure they had expelled all of the leaven in their house. But however, as Jesus taught, their hearts were filthy and their hearts were still full. Their hearts were stained with sin. They were stained with uh, bitterness. They were stained with jealousy. Jesus' number one opponent up to this point has been the Pharisees. But you're going to notice in the Gospels that the closer Jesus gets to the cross, the chief priests begin to take the reins of this thing. The Bible says they were envious of Jesus. 
They were red-faced with jealousy. Every time they saw Jesus with a crowd of people, they thought to themselves, why can't I have a crowd like that? Why aren't those people listening to me? So they were incredibly jealous and envious of Jesus. But the problem is, is that the chief priests were limited on what they could do. They were limited on one hand by the people because the people looked at Jesus as a prophet. And if they arrested Jesus in front of people, there would be a riot break out among the people because they looked at him as a man of God. But then they were limited on the other hand by the Roman authority. See, the Roman authority had made it unlawful for them to put a man to death. The only person in the region that had the power to do that was the Roman governor. There were many pilgrims present in Jesus for the Passover. They were willing to listen to the Lord and listen to the words that he spoke. And the priests did not want to risk an uprising. So in that, they had two goals. Goal number one was to find a way to arrest Jesus away from the crowd. If they could get Jesus by himself, they could arrest him. If they could wait till there was nobody around Jesus and they could arrest Jesus and avoid a mob, they could avoid a riot. These priests, they did not fear God, but they definitely feared the people. And isn't that the definition of so many pastors today? They do not fear God, but they fear the people. They won't preach the whole counsel of God because they fear the people will quit coming. That's the definition of somebody today who's a charlatan, who's a, who's a sellsword, somebody who uh, doesn't own the vineyard. He's just a workman. He doesn't care about the fruit of the vineyard. Number two, they wanted to avoid killing him on the Passover itself. You see, tensions were high during the Passover with all these people there. Now, you ask, why, why was there tension? This is supposed to be a holiday. This is supposed to be a day of celebration. <clears throat> why were tensions high during the Passover? We see the Romans weren't dumb. The Romans knew what the Passover was really about. The Passover was a celebration of the Jews coming out from under an oppressive power, which was the Egyptians. And now the Jews are again under an oppressive power, which was the Romans. So the Romans understood this. So they knew that it, when it was Passover time, it was time to make their presence known. It was time for the soldiers to come out in their best garb and their shields and make their presence known. Presence known. It was time for the leaders to come into town. That's why Pilate was not in Caesarea Maritime. Pilate was in Jerusalem. That's why Herod was not in Tiberias. Herod was in Jerusalem because they're trying to make a, their presence known to keep tensions down. They're trying to figure out the chief priests. They're trying to figure out a way to kill Jesus. They're trying to figure out the best way to do that. And Judas was their answer. Because Judas told them, I can get him alone. I can bring you to him when nobody's around him, when he's not around a crowd. Verse 3, And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Hiscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. This is a very interesting statement. And we see the statement made of Judas twice. Once during the planning of the betrayal, and another time during the execution of the betrayal, that Satan had entered him. What that tells us about Judas is that he was lost. He was lost. He wasn't a child of God. We get this idea. I, I want you to picture what this festival was like during that day. Jewish historians have told us that at any given time during this time period, there were in and around Jerusalem on any given day, usually about 400,000 people. 
keep in mind that Josephus tells us that there was one particular Passover during this time where no less than 256,000 lambs were slaughtered. What that means is one lamb per family and you break all that down. What that means is that there were probably between two and two and a half million Jews in Jerusalem during this time. And they all slaughtered their lambs in the same two hour window. What we would know from three to five p.m. The average lamb serves ten. That's a minimum. Serves a minimum of ten people. And so this is how we get this number. Without Judas's help, it would have been absolutely impossible in all this sea of people for them to get Jesus alone. Verse 4. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him the money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So during Passover, there could be no leaven in the house. And so what they would do is they would have a little ceremony with the kids, kind of like what we would know as an Easter egg hunt. They would take the leaven and they'd take little pouches of leaven and they would hide the leaven throughout the house. They would hide it under the table, behind the vase. They would hide the leaven behind the bush. And then they would let the kids go through and get all of the leaven and bring it out of the house. And they would say, oh, you missed one. And the kids would go back in and scramble and find the leaven. And they would bring the leaven outside of the house. This was the kind of ritual that they would do every year. The reason why they did this is because leaven in the Bible represents sin. And the Bible says that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Judas was the leaven in Jesus' lump. He was the leaven in Jesus' entourage. He didn't really believe in Jesus. He really didn't believe that Jesus was God. And it took just a little bit of leaven to bring that whole house down. Or seven. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. Now, Nisan for the Jews is the first month of the year. It's like our January. On the 10th day of that month, you selected a lamb. You took that lamb and you brought that lamb into your house for a few days. So for a few days, that lamb became a part of your family. Your kids would play with this lamb. They would pet this lamb. This lamb would become a pet in your house. But then on the 14th day, you would take that lamb out of your home and you would bring that lamb to the temple where that lamb would be slaughtered. You would then bring that lamb back to your house to eat that lamb. I want you to see the dilemma that you might be in. The kids come in from play and they ask mom and dad, where is the little lamb that we were playing with? Where is it? And the dad has to say, I hope you're hungry because they had killed this lamb and you had to eat this lamb. So on the 14th day, the lamb was killed and the lamb was eaten. Number two, we're going to call this section of the passage Passover preparation. Verse 8. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. Now, Luke's gospel is the only account that actually gives us the names of the apostles that made the preparation. Peter and John were logical choices. They were part of Jesus' inner circle. They were the two The two disciples who ran to the tomb when the women told them that Jesus' body was missing. Jesus knew that there was a plot to kill him. He knew that Judas would soon be looking for his opportunity to betray the Son of Man. But Jesus was also prepared. This preparation had been made for a long time. Jesus' whole life had led up to this. Why? Because Jesus had a schedule to keep. Jesus had marks that he had to hit. And he had to hit those marks at specific times. 
You see, there were prophecies in the Old Testament that needed to be fulfilled. There's typology in the Old Testament that needs to be made complete. Jesus had to be killed on a Friday at the same time that the lambs were being slain at the temple between 3 to 5 p.m. He had to die at the same time that the lambs were dying. All this had to happen on time. All of this had to happen on point. Jesus had a schedule to keep because he's fulfilling the types. He's fulfilling the prophecies. He's fulfilling the shadows of the Old Testament. So when he says that he goes and prepares a place and he tells them to prepare for this meal, there's a lot to that. They had already selected the lamb. It was selected on the 10th. Peter and John were the ones who took it to the temple. They had to have it slaughtered. They had to bring it back to the house that they were going to have the meal in. And they had to prepare it and roast it and get it ready for the meal. They also had to get all the elements together for the Passover meal. Did you know that the Passover meal had four glasses of wine in that Seder meal? You had the four glasses and you had the unleavened bread and and the bitter herbs. And so it takes prep time to get this meal together. Verse 9. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. Now, me and you might think this is an impossible task. All these millions of people in the city and they're going to pick out one guy carrying pitchers of water. Well, it's really not as hard as you might think, because back in back in ancient Israel, this was forgive the term woman's work. This was a woman's work. This was a woman's job. In fact, we go to Samaria to the woman at the well. Why was the woman at the well? Because it was the women's job to go and get the water for the day. So when you see a man carrying a pitcher of water, it was a very rare thing that you would rarely see. And they would easily be able to pick pick it out. This is the guy. Verse 11. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, listen, there are several memorials in Washington, D.C., There are several monuments in Washington, D.C. There's the Lincoln Memorial. There's the Washington Memorial. And I've never been to D.C., but one day I'd like to go. I'd like to go to the capital of our nation and see these different monuments and these different memorials. Some of you in here have seen these things. You've you've seen the Lincoln Memorial. You've you've seen the Washington Memorial. And if you were a religious figure and you wanted people to remember you and remember what you'd done... Well, you would probably choose a temple. Maybe you would have a temple chosen with your name inscribed in the front of the temple. Or maybe you would even commission the building of a statue where your likeness is chiseled into a statue. And generations can come for years and look at your image chiseled in to a big piece of marble. But Jesus didn't want a temple. Jesus did not want a statue. There's only one thing that Jesus wanted to say, this is what I want you to remember me by. And it was a meal, a meal. That's what Jesus chose for us to remember him and his work by. And when we share that meal with other people, when we're in the same room, when we're in the house of God on the Lord's day and we have the Lord's supper with one another, we are all partaking the same thing into our bodies. We're all taking the same meal into ourselves, and it's adding to our person. And we're all being the, the same meal is becoming a part of all of us at the same time. And that joins us together. It makes us together. It brings brings us into unification where this meal is all becoming part of our bodies at the same time. However, I need to point this out because you need to know this. 
In this story of the Passover in the Bible, there's a contradiction. There's an apparent contradiction when it comes to Jesus eating this Passover meal. There's a discrepancy that the, 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 uh, the critics and the skeptics and the atheists like to point out. And they point at this discrepancy and they point at this contradiction and say, ha ha, see the Bible isn't infallible. It isn't perfect. There's a mistake in the word of God. There's a mistake in the gospels. And here is the contradiction. Here's the issue. We have Jesus with his disciples eating the Passover meal, and we can safely say it's about Thursday evening when they did so. However, in John chapter 18, it's the next, next morning, Jesus has been through a night of trials, and he's standing before Pilate, and the Jews say, we can't go into the praetorium because we'd be defiled and we wouldn't be able to eat the Passover meal. Let's read the verse, John 18, 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium, so they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Oh, well, there you go right there. Contradiction. How in the world could Jesus eat the Passover on Thursday night with his disciples, but yet on Friday the Jews wouldn't go into the praetorium because they wanted to eat the Passover meal? Contradiction right there. How do you reconcile this? Well, fortunately for us, history unveils the mystery about this. According to Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, he wasn't Christian, and according to the Mishnah, so this isn't a Christian source. This is a Jewish source. The Mishnah tells us this. Those in Galilee kept a different calendar from those in Jerusalem. You see, the traditional Jewish day was from sunset to sunset. That's why in Genesis, in the creation account, it says the evening and the morning was the first day. Me and you would say the morning and the evening was the first day, but not a Jew. Jews' day is from sunset to sunset. So they would say the evening and the morning are the first day. Now, for those in Galilee, because they were mostly Hellenistic Jews, because they did so much business with the Romans, and they did so much business with the Gentiles, they reckon their days from sunrise to sunrise, okay? Uh, just give me a little uh, modern day example. There's... All of the state of Indiana is Eastern time zone. There's only one county in the whole state that's central. And that's Lake County, Indiana. Because I used to live in Lake County, Indiana. And you know why Lake County, Indiana is the only county in Indiana that's central time zone? Because it's near Chicago. Illinois is central time zone. So all the people that live in Lake County, they work in Chicago. And that's so they adjusted the time because of that. So for Galileans, the 14th of Nisan was on Thursday from sunrise to sunrise. But the 14th of Nisan for those that lived in and around Jerusalem was Thursday evening at sunset to Friday evening at sunset. And so this not only solves our discrepancy, it also solves another big problem. Because when you have millions of people trying to slaughter lambs at the same time, it can get a little crowded. But because of this, you had two shifts. You had the Thursday shift and you had the Friday shift. So one on Thursday, one on Friday. Because of this, Jesus could eat the Passover with his disciples. But then the next day, at the same time he's on the cross dying, the lambs could be slaughtered at the temple. Amazing, amazing fulfillment. Our third section of this passage we're going to call Passover Participation. Verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. John, so it says here that when the hour had come, he reclined at the table. In, G, in, in John chapter 2, Jesus is at the wedding of Cana. His mother Mary comes up to him and says, they have no, no wine for the wedding. And Jesus says, woman, what is that? I wish I could get away calling my mother woman. But he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? 
My hour has not yet come. John chapter 7, Jesus' brothers tried to get him to go to Judea to the festival. And he said he could not do it because his time had not yet come. Again, in John chapter 7, they, they tried to arrest him. And they, the Bible says they were not able to arrest him because his hour had not yet come. In John chapter 8, once again, they tried to arrest him. They tried to get a hold of him in the temple and they couldn't do that because his hour had not yet come. But we see here in this verse, the hour is here. The hour in which the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Verse 15, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus did more than say, I desire to eat a Passover with you. He said, I have earnestly and fervently desired to eat this Passover with you. This Passover is different than all the other ones that he's going to share with them. This Passover is the fulfillment of everything Jesus came to do. This was his last chance to teach his apostles. This Passover was his chance to institute a new covenant with his people and with his church. The Bible says that he fervently and that he earnestly desired to eat this Passover. Jesus had been looking forward to this moment all of his life. This was not only the first communion, but this was the last Passover of any significant amount of time. This is the last, this is the last Passover from the Old Testament. I know they still keep the Passover today. All the Passover meals they're doing today, they don't count. This one was the last one. After this, the meaning of the meal will be completely changed. It's going to be turned into something new. It's going to be turned into the Eucharist. It's going to be turned into communion. It's going to be turned into the Lord's Supper. Passover has been going on for 1,500 years, and this is the last one. Millions and millions of, of animals had been slain and sacrificed. Why? Because no animal was ever good enough. That's why they had to keep sacrificing them. And they, have to, they had to kill lamb after lamb after lamb. And they had to do it over and over and over because no one animal was good enough. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And now it's over. It's done. On the cross, Jesus will cry out to tell us die, which means it is finished. All the pomp and circumstance of the Old Testament, all the ceremony and all of the ritual, all the robes and the hoods and the garments and the pomegranate tassels and the, the gold lace cherubs and the temple, the altars and the incense, it will all be over. It's all fulfilled. The Catholic Church has something called a continual mass. What is that? The Catholics have scheduled their masses in such a way where at any given time on the earth there's a Catholic mass going on and the reason for this is because they say they have to keep the sacrifice of Jesus going I'm so thankful I've read the New Testament I'm so thankful I've read the New Testament and my Jesus said it is finished Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. He's, hey, his sacrifice isn't still going on today. Bless God, his sacrifice is over. It's done. It's fulfilled. It's complete. Jesus has been looking forward to this meal with his disciples for so long because it is the beginning of the end of his work. But before that feast, Jesus informs them of a fast. Verse 16, for I say uh, to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. 
Jesus is in heaven. He has not celebrated a Passover yet. He's waiting for us. Now, did you know in the millennial kingdom, there will be a Passover meal? It's not going to be this. It's going to be a modified version of the Passover. But instead of looking back to Exodus, it's going to look back to the cross. Our final section this morning is called Passover progression. It's the last two verses, verses 19 and 20. It's, I call it Passover progression because the meal is about to progress forward. It's about to be transformed. It's about to be changed into something new. Verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, This cup, which, this cup, which is poured out for, for you is the new covenant in my blood. Did you know that the Passover revolved around four glasses of wine? And at the time of Christ, there was, an, there was an order in which you had to drink them. The word Seder actually means order. Uh, the first glass of wine was the Kaddush or the blessing. And what would happen is the host of the meal would, would use the glass of wine and they would, he would bless the Lord and he would bless the guests of the meal. The second cup was called the cup of judgment. It was during this time that the host, and in this case Jesus, would retell the story of the Passover and the judgment that fell upon the Egyptians. During this time, they would break the bread and they would break the bread and dip the bread into the bitter herbs. And that would remind them of the bitterness of their bondage and their slavery. Then they would take the bread and dip it into something called the caracet. The caracet is this gummy uh, type thing which kind of reminded them of mortar. It reminded them of the bricks that they had to make in Egypt. Then after that, the lamb was eaten. They would have a long, leisurely meal. And I've told you this before. He would, Jesus would lean on his left hand. His right hand would be free to eat the food, to drink the wine. Beside Jesus and uh, and during this time, they would also be free to have open conversation. They could say whatever they wanted to say. And they would talk back and forth in fellowship. Right beside Jesus on either side to Jesus' right, first of all, was John. We know this because the Bible tells us that John would lean back onto the bosom of Jesus. He would lean back on the chest of Jesus uh, to speak with him because John was to his right. And on the left of Jesus was Judas. Judas was right beside Jesus. That way, Jesus could take that bread and dip that bread in the sop and give it to Judas who was sitting right beside him. Think about this. Those two positions, they were positions of honor and they were only granted by permission of the host. So it was Jesus that said, John, I I want you right here to my right. And it was Jesus that said, Judas, I want you to sit right here beside me, buddy, right next to me. Jesus reaching out to Judas even until the very end. Verse 20. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Man, I wish I had time to unpack that whole verse. But we've run out of time. If the sacrifice of the Old Testament are the 1.0 version, then the sacrifice of Jesus is the 2.0 version. And it's the final version. After this, it's complete. This, this is the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God. 
and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. This, of course, this new covenant is the promise of the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, and the justification of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, with this meal tonight, the old covenant is done. The Old Testament is over. That's it. It's finished. It's complete. It's fulfilled. This is the beginning of the new covenant. John the Baptist cried out when he first saw Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's the reason why Jesus came. In Genesis, it was one lamb per person. In Exodus, it was one lamb per family. On the Day of Atonement, it was one lamb per nation. Jesus was the Lamb of God who was sacrificed to deliver the whole world from the power and penalty of sin. And without the Lamb's blood, we would have suffered God's judgment. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus and His substitutionary death, we would have no hope of salvation. Many people talk about why Jesus came to the earth. Came to bring peace. Came to bring social justice. Came to bring inclusion. Came to bring love for everybody. No. Son of man did not come to bring togetherness. He actually came by his own word to bring separation. He came to bring a sword. He came to bring division. He came to pit daughter against mother and father against son. The son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. And the gospel separates the lost from the saved. It separates the ghosts, the goats from the sheep. One more thing I want to point out to you this morning is Jesus said, my body is given for you. This is the New Testament. This is the New Testament in my blood. This cup which is poured out for you. The personal pronouns in this passage make all the difference. Anybody who reads it, reads it the same way. His blood and his body was given for you. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to suffer for them. He said that he was going to die for them. And this is true. Jesus died for everyone. You ever get junk mail? I'm sure you do. We all do. We know what it's like to get that junk mail. You know the kind I'm talking about. It doesn't have a return address. Uh, a lot of times they print it on there like it's handwriting, but you can tell it's printed. It says occupant. It says resident. It says the person who lived at the house before you. I can't tell you how many pieces of letter I got for Faxton. Okay. I keep getting mail for him. And, and, and so we have, we get junk mail all the time. And even if your name is on it, it's misspelled. It's computer generated. You can tell. But when you open that mailbox and you see a letter in that mailbox... And you can tell it's handwritten. You can, there's, an, there, there's a return address on it with a name and address that you recognize. And somebody has actually taken the time to write you a letter personally. Usually those are the pieces of mail we open first. That almost always gives us a sense of pleasure. Personal mail shows that someone has taken the time to communicate with them. Jesus wrote you a love letter called the Bible. And in it, he tells us just how much he loves us. It's funny. I've had this Bible for a long time. And I could still thumb through this Bible and I can find a note, a letter from Emily. Maybe back when we were dating. Have a nice day. I love you, sweetheart. And I would read those notes and be reminded of her love for me. That's what the Bible is. It's a love letter from Jesus. 
And every once in a while, we need to be reminded of what he went through for us. We need to be reminded when we hear the story. You need to be moved with compassion, Christian, when you hear that he gave his body for you. Your soul and your spirit need to be moved when you hear that the blood of Jesus was shed for you. That's why the Lord's Supper carries with it a personal responsibility because he did it for us personally. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. The purpose of it is to help us remember what Jesus did for us, what he's still doing for us. We are never more the church. We are never more the bride of Christ than when we gather around the Lord's table to remember him. May we never forget what that Lord's Supper means. What the wine and the bread stand for. His last Passover was our first taste of heaven. Never forget it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. I'm going to ask you to meditate on this story. I'm going to ask you to meditate on what Jesus' sacrifice has done for you. I want you to think about where you would be if Jesus didn't get a hold of your life. I want you to think about where you would have ended up if he did not come to this earth Leave his throne of glory. Leave heaven. To come to this earth and suffer and die for us. Where you would be going to if he did not pay your sin debt. If he did not take the penalty of your sin. I'm so thankful for the substitution of Christ. Should have been me on that cross. I should have been the one that died. But even if I would have died for myself, I still would not have been able to pay the debt. I would die still owing a debt. But Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God. He was so righteous and perfect, His righteousness can be applied to everyone. I ask you, day to Christian. Part of being a Christian is meditating on this truth. And that's what I ask you to do this morning. As always, if you're in here and you don't know that you're saved, we can take a Bible and show you how you can know that you know that you're on your way to heaven. Spend some time in prayer and gratitude this morning during this invitation. I'm going to pray. And then our invitation will begin. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the last Passover. Lord, we're thankful that you were in that upper room with your apostles. That you introduced and reinterpreted the Passover to them. They passed it on to the early church. It is passed down for 2,000 years to this church. Lord, next month when we take the Lord's Supper, may we remember what it stands for. May we contemplate the sacrifice and be thankful for the blessed hope that came with your death, that came with your burial, that came with your resurrection. Lord, we're thankful for the new covenant. We're thankful that we have the law written in our hearts. We're thankful, we're thankful that we have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads and guides and directs us and gives us words to say and helps us make our decisions. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and gives us a desire to love you and live for you. All of these great gifts you gave us through the cross. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we remember this morning. Be with our invitation. In Jesus' name I pray.